This is the Control Dock, a super low latency analog and digital vintage controller to USB interface for PC, Mac, Linux, your RetroPie, Mister, and a whole lot more. And it's available now, thanks to the boffins downstairs. And one of those boffins is right here with me. It's Richard from Heber. Thank you for joining us, Richard. Thank you, Neil. You've come all the way up the stairs. All the way up the stairs, <laughs> To yeah. show us um, what's called the Control Dock. Uh, here is one such example, because it comes in three forms, which we'll cover today. But um, let's just start with the basics. Why does this exist, Richard? It exists, Neil, because we were asked a lot of times for interfaces to classic controllers. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when we looked at what was available in the marketplace, we weren't really that happy with some of the controls, some of the products that are out there, the latency on them, and we wanted to do a better job. So we thought, why not at least start with the D9 and the D15 because they are, cover quite a wide range of yeah. controls. So this is one such example of a product. I'm not picking this one out for any other reason than <laughs> it's the one that I've got. This is a Mega Drive controller adapter, which I think I got it off of Amazon several years ago. It did the job. I could plug my Mega Drive stick yeah. in, digital only, so it had no analog support for things yep. like mice, trackballs, spinners. As you say, it works. Um, I'm not even sure whether it worked with the six button pads. Hmm. Can't remember whether we checked that, but yes, it does actually function as an interface for a control, but very, uh, very slow, very low, very long latency on the controls, which basically means lag between you pressing the button and something happening on the screen. Uh, we also found that there was quite a lot of variable latency, and this was up to sort of 40, 50 milliseconds, which is a very long time when you're trying to play an action game or even a platform or whatever else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, quite significant amounts of delays uh, in the USB bus. Compensated perhaps by my middle age reaction times, but yeah, when you put indeed. it to the test, you find that um, <laughs> it's not actually that great. But it's also not that expensive, so you kind of get what you pay for with these products. Don't yes, you? yeah, they're cheap and cheerful, and they do work if all you want to do is plug in your control and just about make them work. Yeah. yeah. So you came up with um, a bit more of a premium product, a bit more of a quality product, yep. and tell us what's on the board because we've got the bare board here. Yeah. So. First thing we had to decide was uh, what microcontroller to use. And during the pandemic, there's obviously been a lot of problems getting hold of any sort of microcontrollers where you need lots of inputs and outputs and controls. Uh, we ended with uh, the Raspberry Pi. So mm -hmm. the Pi Pico is a really nice little uh, module. You can buy the raw chips on their own and put them down on the board, but actually the little SPI flash that comes on the Pico module um, is quite expensive on its own. So those modules work out to be quite good value for money, really. So we use that as a starting point for the board. Um, because it's got quite a lot of inputs and outputs, we can actually use that for lots of different controls. So the whole point with this project is it's a starting point. But what we wanted to do was allow for lots of other functions. So analog inputs mm -hmm. for um, the rear stats or potentiometers that you might find on the spinners, such as these on the paddles, um, and also plenty of other types of controls um, that may do other methods for detecting uh, some of the other buttons. So the Mega Drive six button pad is a good example. It uses a clock serial shifted data that goes in and out um, and actually uses that to expand the, the number of buttons that you've got on the pad. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. And possibly even controllers that we haven't even thought of because Definitely. it's pretty easy to update the firmware on this thing as an end user, isn't it? Yeah, this really is a starting point. So we're launching this onto the market with um, a number of controls that you can just plug in and use. Uh, it's got a rotary switch on the front that you can use to select the mode. Um, that switch can be reconfigured to do different modes and different controllers. And you may end up with multiple different firmwares for doing really exotic things or even custom things. So we intend to use this platform as a starting point for lots of other control systems. And some of those might be arcade controls, spinners, um, optical 
uh, joysticks, all sorts of different things. Um, and we've already had quite a lot of in, uh, input from people uh, yep. that want all sorts of different controls covered as well. Yeah, I want my flight stick and my throttle. Pins yeah. Richard. I know flight sims aren't as big in demand as, say, a Super Nintendo pad, but um, yeah. one day maybe it will, that will get to the front of the queue. And I should also say that the knob in the prototype version, this is the final version, but the prototype version was a Pac-Man. And uh, Richard was very attached to yeah. his Pac-Man <laughs> dial, but um, we, we thought maybe it might be testing the boundaries of copyright, so yeah. no more Pac-Man. Yeah. Um, you can print your own. You can, you can print your own. It's a, it's a fairly standard little D uh, connection on there for putting that on. That knob was also the reason why this, is, this has taken quite a long time to get to market, because we had these on order and they took nine months to arrive. Um, we did do a design change to accommodate various other switches in that time, but we also couldn't get hold of those. So we waited and waited and we finally got the knobs. Right. Um, so the first batch is fully very expensive knobs, <laughs> but they are very, very nice. Um, they're very nicely machined. They work really well. Uh, and yes, they work, they work great. Yeah. So, yeah. so the board is available in three um, varieties, isn't it? So yes. board only. So you might want to use it for your own project. Yep. 3D print uh, a case of your own or something like that. Um, it's available standalone in this 3D printed case designed by Richard. You can buy the case with it or uh, the files are available online yep. so you can download and, and print them in whatever color you like. We're currently doing them in two colors. Two colors for the, for the standalone. Control dock, so yeah. black and this color matched to the Amiga 500. So we've imported yeah. this from the US. <laughs> it's printed solid filament. A color match to the Amiga 500 and it is a spot on match. If you mm. put a 500 or a TV modulator next to it, it is identical. So that's available in, in two options. Exactly the same board inside, no difference. A couple of LED holes at the front here, which light up. What do they signify yeah. power on one of them? Uh, when they're connected in and when they're, um, when they're connected to the computer. So right. yeah, so when you've got a, uh, um, a device connected into one of the control ports, yeah. Yeah. And then the third variety of this is what we call the slice. Yes. which is aimed, so keep in mind, this is not specifically a multi-system or a Mr. product. It supports your Pi, supports your PC, your Mac, everything like that. But if you happen to have a Mr. multi-system, we wanted to make it so that it would integrate nicely. So that's where this case comes in. Yeah. And this just slots underneath the multi-system, which docks on top of it, and then it becomes a complete console again Absolutely, with the additional yeah. ports. That's right. So you can put one at the front and the back, so you could actually fit two on or different versions in the future. Um, and it just gives a nice little uh, finish to the multi-system or to any, any other um, compatible products that, that go out with that sort of form factor. So those are the different flavors that you can get the Control Dock. Control Dock Classic SE. That's what this one's called. It's to give it its full name. Yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a mouthful. Um, it, it, will, it will get cut down. The SE is really just to signify the knob in this special first edition. version, the special edition. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Gives us some wriggle room to yeah. give future yeah. versions yeah. different yeah. names. We are just calling it the control dock for now. <laughs> and then um, let's talk about what it supports. So okay. yeah. D9, D15, we've got some examples here. Um, Atari trackball, yes. analog obviously, the paddles, analog. The, the Atari 2600 paddles are two into one D9, aren't they? And That's it supports right. that. Yes. Yeah. Um, we've got the Sega Mega Drive pad, does it support the six button pad? It does, yes, supports six. three and six button pads, yeah. Two players, both with six buttons. That's correct, yeah. Yep. Um, the classic Amiga Tank mouse. Yes. And the Atari ST mouse, both supported. A lot of them are very similar. The difference is really between the Amiga and Atari is, I think the Y is just around the other way. So it's just different pins that need to be reconfigured. Um, with the way we've got the electronic setup on there, we can basically make any pin an input or output and move the analog around as needed. So if there's a really obscure pad or a really obscure mouse or a really obscure analog device or a spinner, we should be able to make the firmware work for that. And one such example, which I'll be honest, it's probably not gonna be in huge demand, but mm. we wanted to squeeze it in there was the Amiga CD32 pad. Yes. What was special about that? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's quite a strange one. Um, different level voltages and also uh, uh, different ways of doing it. So I think um, our engineer, Nick, who really threw himself into this project and was trying to get controllers from everyone. And we borrowed some, we borrowed some Neo Geo controllers, we borrowed all sorts of different ones, um, found it really enjoyable to sort of just try and get all of these controllers working. I don't think we got a JAG one working in the end, but that's no. only because we, we didn't have um, an adapter to use for it. So once we once we get one of those, we can try um, and pretty much anything else that uh, that supports those controller types or can be adapted. That's the other thing. You can actually do a little 
um, wiring adapter outside to convert uh, slightly different configurations of connector mm -hmm. into those those ones that can go onto that. I'll, I'll keep going. Amstrad CPC joysticks, yes. um, Sinclair sticks as well. Yeah, they're supported. We've got the um, Sega Master System over there. Even the Atari Twenty Six Hundred keypad, which you would use with things like Star Raiders, wouldn't yeah, you? I think absolutely. Um, just yeah. looks like a telephone keypad. That's supported. Yeah. And as Richard says, pretty much anything can be added if we know it exists and we can get a hold of one to test it with, then we can um, update the firmware. Just talk us through the firmware update process because it's so simple. It's worth people knowing about it. Yeah, it's really it's really simple. And a lot of this is the fact that it's using the Pi Pico and they've made that very simple for everyone to use. So all you do, you hold down the button, you plug in the connector and it just looks like a, uh, a USB memory stick on your computer. So there's just a drive with a couple of generic files that sit in there. You just drag the firmware over to it. And the second you do that, it disappears and you think, oh, what's happened? But actually all it's done is it's reflashed the firmware and updated the SPI flash on the board. Everything's then done. Um, updated, it takes literally about two seconds to do. So Good. that's it. So really easy to change if you want to. Um, you, you could have custom configurations that you might want for specific things. Uh, one of the very first things we did when we were testing out uh, the mouse uh, connections was to put an optical uh, trackable uh, actual arcade one on there. And that just used the same Amiga inputs uh, and you can scale that how you want. So there's all sorts of different options you can do to get devices like that that use optical inputs or spinner inputs. And then when it comes to some of those analog inputs, there are certain sensitivity settings that you've added as well, haven't you, for the spinners? Yes, because uh, we had quite a lot of um, options on the rotary dial, Nix put in some different uh, settings basically to give you more or less um, resolution with the spinners and the mice because <laughs> the old mice, especially from the Amigas, were very low DPI and mm. they would move very quickly across your CRT screen on a modern um, input. Uh, they go very, very slow indeed. <laughs> There's a lot of pixels on a 4K screen compared yeah. to an old Amiga CRT. If you're using Windows, you can whack the sensitivity up in there and then it becomes perfectly usable. I mean, I'm not sure I'd want to use the tank mouse day to day. No. But then to dip into WinUAE, for example, and have a game of Lemmings, it's Ooh, perfect. Yeah, it gives yeah. you that really good, authentic feel. Definitely. What if I wanted to um, change the controller on the fly? Do I need to unplug the USB? Can yeah, I hot there is swap a, the controllers? How does it work? You can, you can. There, there is a setting for if you if you're doing if you're going from one control to something very different, say from the standard Atari um, joystick through to a uh, a mouse that's using the different port and the different setting, you can turn it all the way to the zero setting and that will tell the controller to expect a change of, of um, controls. So that's the official way to do it. But actually it's more than happy if you just plug them in and you just turn it to the setting and it will actually just settle down. It'll take a few seconds to identify the new control, go into the right mode and, uh, and set up exactly as you need. So yes, you can pretty much use this without having to keep unplugging it and that sort mm. of thing. And there is some built-in safety, isn't there, to yes. stop us frying the board? Yeah, there's quite a lot of built-in safety on there. Um, there's overcurrent protection on the inputs and outputs, so it won't draw too much power. We're still sort of experimenting with controls that take power, so there are some con modern controls that use Wi-Fi uh, dongles that plug into mm. the DE9s, and there we're still sort of refining those to work as best as we can with the, the traditional ports, um, the Mega Drive one and that sort of thing, that there's quite a few available. So we've got to be a little bit careful though because they do use a little bit more power than a standard port. Uh, and we are detecting how much power and allowing that, that much to go through. Other than that, yes, you've got a bit of protection on uh, inputs and things being connected in uh, on the wrong port with the wrong setting. So if you put the mouse on and you've actually got it set to be a, an Atari joystick, it's not going to blow up. Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, I've been splicing in as we chat here some examples of it in use, but let's see a few more because I've been having a lot of fun with this. So the first example here, of course, the first thing I grabbed was the Amiga Tank mouse. So here I am using it on my laptop in Windows 10, working fine, just like a normal mouse with those sensitivity settings turned up. And then uh, I switched to the Atari ST mouse, a mouse I'm less familiar with, Richard, but um, I, I gave it a go. Are you, are you a tank mouse or an ST mouse? Uh, obviously a tank uh, mouse. Tank yeah. mouse man, tank mouse man. Um, and then this is detected in Windows as, as a mouse, just as a normal mouse. And then the joystick shows up in game controllers in Windows and 
the equivalent in your Mac or Linux or, or whatever else. It's a, it's a HID, isn't it, device? Yes, yeah. It's a standard human user interface device. So you can use it just like any normal device and you can see it here in Windows detecting the directional presses and the, and the button presses. So that's all good. Then I had a little go on WinUAE playing Lemmings, Mark Fix's stuff's favorite game. Here it is, working fine. And actually the sensitivity feels spot on for me. Oh, it feels, it's very responsive. It feels just like you're using an Amiga. Uh, likewise with a Competition Pro joystick straight into the D9 port to play uh, a few rounds of Turrican 2. That was great. And then just to be slightly sadistic, here's an Atari mouse on Workbench in WinUAE. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so that, that was some experiments with the PC. Then I switched over to Mista using our multi-system, but of course it would work on any Mista system. And um, here I am using the tank mouse again in the Amiga core, the Mini MiniMig core, playing a, a few rounds of battle chess and losing quite badly. Over here now is the C64 core with the Competition Pro again. And then just to mix it up, because you don't have to use the Amiga mouse and the Amiga core, although it feels right. Uh, here's a Mega Drive pad being used in the ZX Spectrum core for a game of Bubble Bobble, which I know is one of your favorites. Uh, worked absolutely fine. Feels like you're cheating a little bit using a Mega Drive pad in a ZX Spectrum. You oh, need a, yeah. like a slightly shonky joystick on a ZX Spectrum. In that instance, I was using the, the standalone um, control dock with the multi-system, which you might want to do because you could unplug it, move it over to your Pi, move it over to your, you know, you might want that portability. Here are a few more examples of it in use. So you get the idea from those examples. We could go on showing you every combination of stick, but, um, they work and it's <laughs> they work really well. It's, it's great fun playing with these. Um, let's talk about latency because that's a big feature of this, isn't it? Yeah, it How really is. How do we is. measure latency? Yeah, so normally what you would do with latency testing is actually wire up the port you were testing um, into a device where you can actually have something that responds after the button has been pressed. So that's exactly what we did with our multi-system. We set up a FPGA core that we could have an output pin mm -hmm. that would go high as soon as that's detected in the core. Um, then we can actually detect how many milliseconds or less there is between button pressing and that core being activated and knowing that the signal's there. Because mm -hmm. this is all going through USB, there is a a natural latency with the USB protocol. Um, on the most system, on Mister, it is very, very low. So that is giving us an advantage already. You will get that benefit anyway with those systems, but you will also get a benefit from the firmware that we've written on this in things like Raspberry Pi or your PC or your mm -hmm. laptop or Linux standard. What's the lowest we've seen on this, the, the, the quickest response? Um, we, uh, we've, got, we've, got, we've got to be a bit careful with that because you can go very low, right. but you end up not debouncing your signals. So you end up having spurious uh, signals. So the last thing you want is someone to be doing a platformer and it suddenly jumps on you or it suddenly presses the button because it thinks it's got a signal uh, because there's been a little bit of noise there. So there's always a little bit of processing. And that was true back in the day with the original sure. systems. They, they all had to do that. Um, but typically we're seeing around uh, 700 nanoseconds point seven of a millisecond up to about 1.4 milliseconds um, and lower in some cases as well. Mm -hmm. The highest uh, latency is with the analog inputs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty good. Yeah. I mean, compared to the 50 milliseconds of something like this. Yeah. And that was that was variable as well. So sometimes it would be 50, sometimes it'd be 20, sometimes it was even more than that. And actually it's the variability that's very difficult for players to to uh, get used to. If it, if it stays constant, you can train yourself to always have that, that little bit of delay. Mm -hmm. When it's jumping around all over the place, it's not very good. So I did jump into our Discord server and ask if anyone had any questions just before we started the video. And the main one that came back was from, I've got one from Reese here. Okay. Um, and he just wants to know what's the main advantage or disadvantage of this over 
for example, snack adapters in Mista? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the snack adapters do work very well. They're very low latency and they work very well for each individual core. They are very specific to the core. So you have to have the Atari for the Atari core. You have to have the PlayStation for the PlayStation core. And you can't use those in the different cores because they are wired exactly as the core would expect to see them as real hardware. So pretty much like you can't put a Super Nintendo into a... Atari, you couldn't yeah. do that with the snacks as well. So what we wanted to do is give people choice. And as you've seen, uh, using an Atari mouse or an Amiga mouse on any, anything that looks like it, it wants to accept a mouse uh, is possible with this, where that wouldn't be possible at all with the snacks. Yeah, and you can also navigate the on-screen menus in Mr. using this, which you can oh, yes. with your snacks. So. Yeah, that's right. You normally have to have another control in place just to get those menu signals into the game and then you can use the snack. Whereas this, it just works as a standard uh, USB device. Um, and Mr. picks it up, the multi-system does as well. And then pretty much every other question that I got was mm -hmm. along the lines of, will this support controller X, Y, Z? Will this support the, the NES, the SNES, <laughs> the you know PC flight sticks, etc." So how do we address that question? Yeah, well, we had to make some decisions on the actual physical connectors we put on the board. So they are D9s and D15s. So anything you can, you can plug into that, we can explore or you can experiment. Um, the manual that's available does actually say what the chances are for any controls that we haven't looked at and how, right. whether, they, whether they are likely to work or not. And by all means, experiment and let us know. We'd be happy to look at any controls that don't currently um, aren't currently supported in the firmware. Mm -hmm. um, and for things that have a different connector pin out, stay tuned. We plan to have future models of the controller dock that will have other connectors on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then I've just noticed this, Richard. This is a, a different size. Yeah, it's quite controller. a large one. Isn't what it? is this? <laughs> okay. So. Whenever we create a control board or control system, we have to create a test fixture for it to be able to test all the functionality of our board. So Nick, the design engineer, uh, decided to use basically the same principle as the control dock for the test rig. It's just a much more complicated version because it can, <laughs> it can point, it can move any point to any other point on the board. And it also has a really nice LCD screen. So right. we've done a 3D printed case for this and actually a bed of nails that comes down. You put the unit under test, clamp it down, and it tests every single possible function, all of the analog, all of the digital, all of the serial clock data, and tells you whether it's passed or failed. And then we get a, a serial number at the end, which we stick on the bottom to ensure that they all work. But Nick has done a job of putting on faults onto the board to make sure they get picked up. And that's right. a very important part of that <laughs> test process to make sure things that shorts, open circuits, um, and cross wires, that sort of thing, uh, that they all get picked up in the in the test fixture. Excellent. Well, if you're interested in picking one of these up, there is a link in the video description. And also on that link, you'll find the current uh, compatibility matrix so you can see what joysticks and mice mm. and controllers are supported. But um, <clears throat> that will be subject to change as we continue to develop it and, and release new firmware for it. So keep an eye on that for updates and for future versions with different um, ports, adapters, etc. This is this is just the beginning, isn't it, of the, uh, the control dock? Yeah. And keep an eye out for a few more announcements that will be coming up soon um, for our Mr. Multi-System and otherwise there'll be a, a lot more chat about that. In the yeah, this weeks. is a very busy year for us in product development. We've got lots and lots in the pipeline and more to announce throughout the rest of this year. Excellent. But remember, it's not just for Mr. It's for, it's for pretty much anything that you can plug it into. Yeah. So um, I hope this helps some of you to enjoy your retro gaming a little bit more and um, go and check it out. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, Neil.